um, with my brief introduction. Uh, welcome everyone to this info session um, for our study abroad courses in the summer of 2024. Um, and we have with us uh, professors Mauricio Quiros Pacheco, Peter Sealy, and myself, who will be presenting our respect respective courses in three different parts of the world. We also uh, have uh, uh, Bianca Novelli and uh, Tanya Highland from ORSS, who might be able to answer some uh, questions uh, about the running of the course awards and such. Um, and uh, this presentation is part of another two presentations that one of them happened yesterday, another one is happening tomorrow, really kind of uh, explaining and giving you a chance to ask questions about the whole suite of courses that we're offering this summer, um, including the design research internship and the design build uh, classes. Uh, we have three design build classes offered and we have three study abroad studios offered. Uh, they're all part of the same schedule. Um, and uh, there is an application process for them, which we will explain in more detail, but essentially you will be applying through a form online to all uh, all of these courses together through the same form. Um, so before we begin, I would like to acknowledge the land on which our university, University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it has been a traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, the Mississaugas of the Credit. Um, and today, this meeting place is still the home to many indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we're grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. Um, summer courses are, let's say, a, an important addition to our program, and they have been um, organized and expanded over the last uh, few years, especially after COVID. Uh, they are all what we may call um, experiential learning in the sense that you are all placed um, in a context, uh, in a group, uh, in a way of working that is intensive. Um, we, the, the summer schedule really has uh, three weeks uh, in place, uh, so, sorry, six weeks uh, in place. Sorry, I just need one second. Uh, Sorry, there was a party in the in the in the room in front of my office. It was very loud. My apologies. Um, so these courses are um, offered in an intensive framework of six weeks, uh, and uh, some of them take place in Toronto. Some of them take place in different cities across the world, um, and uh, they are uh, impactful to our students. I think uh, the way they've been built and the way they've been offered, they really leave a, a mark uh, in your education, both because you have a chance to um, go out there and, and, and make stuff and, and build stuff as part of a group and understand the construction process or pursue a very um, specific uh, research, design research project uh, within a professional context, uh, between an academic and a professional context, or visit a completely new urban, rural uh, environment across continents uh, and be immersed in a study of new cities, um, at the same time uh, connect with uh, students, uh, professionals in those cities. And this is something that I think in my experience as a teacher uh, and as director of the program, I've seen uh, really positively impact everyone who has had a chance to participate in. Uh, so it's a very important part of our uh, of our curriculum, but also this separate sort of uh, unit of summer programming. Um, there is an application process for the courses and uh, some of them have, have demand. So we try to be as equitable in processing your applications. Uh, they are open to students in their 
really going into their third or fourth year of study. Uh, each 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 unit has a slightly separate uh, set of requirements. Um, but in general, we're really asking you in your application to explain to us your interest in the course. Uh, we'd like to learn a few more things about you. Also understand where are you in your course of study um, and rank your preferences uh, as since you're applying for all of them so that we're able to uh, offer you uh, the opportunity to uh, take at least one of them. Uh, design research internship, the Athens course, and uh, our uh, June design build are pretty much happening at the same time, so you, you cannot take them concurrently. Uh, I think the Costa Rica course and the Berlin course are happening one after the other. Uh, and uh, I think that the other two design builds that will be offered uh, in July and August are also concurrent with some of these courses. So you have to be aware of schedule when you apply, but it's really about also your interests and, and where you feel uh, you want to focus next. Anyway, this session is about Athens, Berlin, and Costa Rica. Um, and we I will ask the instructors, uh, including myself, uh, to present a short version to kind of give you a picture of what this course is, uh, how it will run and what you will be learning. So I will pass it on to Mauricio, uh, who can maybe present the first course. Hello, everyone. Can you see my screen? Yes. Yes? Yes. So first of all, thank you, uh, Petros. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, good, no good morning or good afternoon, everyone. Um, basically, uh, the course that I will be teaching, it's a traveling course, and it's going to be in Costa Rica. It's called No Artificial Ingredients, which uh, it's a bit of a, of, a, of a prank on the actual um, logo of the country, which is, in fact, that one. And the way I structured the talk, it shouldn't take more than 10 minutes, I hope. Uh, it will be just to give you a bit of a background of what the country is about, where it is, uh, the kind of premises that build the country, the kind of sites that we're going to be working on uh, in terms of visiting and traveling, the types of projects that we're going to be developing, um, the kind of activities that are going to be around there. And, Mauricio, uh, are you still on the same slide? Because I think you referred yes, to... Yes, I am. Okay, my apologies. I, I am. I'm just giving uh, uh, the background of the talk, and then I'll show some pa you know, some samples of some past work. Um, and so the first thing that I wanted to talk about is that actually Costa Rica is part of what we call the tropics and the tropics have been, you know, historically this, this sort of imaginary of paradises uh, of coasts and banana republics, but also uh, banana, uh, banana republics are also places for revolutions and they have been, you know, lately extremely romanticized as eco, um, as eco travels or tourist uh, destinations. So the tropics have this kind of like long history, um, again, that it's based between their almost paradise-like nature, their uh, kind of like tumultuous politic background, which I will explain why Costa Rica is a bit different in that particular sense. And now really about that sort of natural environment really becoming sort of like an escape or a tourist uh, environment really uh, operating at a global scale. And so the first thing that I wanted to say is that Costa Rica, Rica, it's not Puerto Rico. Um, that's the first con uh, confusion there is. It's a very tiny little country, which is here. It's right above Panama, below Nicaragua, and it's a very thin country. There's like 150 kilometers between the east and the Pacific coast, which makes it extremely, uh, and it has a tall mountain range in the, in the middle, which gives it a, a quite extreme uh, position in terms of the kind of weather it receives, the kind of tropical um, ecosystem it has. Uh, you see the light here. I, I don't know if you can see the pointer, but that's basically the Panama Canal over there. That's the Nicaragua Lake. And again, it's that very tiny little bridge between North and South America. Um, and it is it, it is a country with an interesting uh, history because uh, this is part of the description of, of the course, but basically it's natural setting, which is, you know, it has sort of unforgiving topography, is really exuberant landscape. But they also became the escape of people who were coming from the north and the south looking for uh, kind of not loneliness, but just being independent within the landscape. And so 
this sort of tropical environment actually became almost the ideology of the country where the early populations came in, they would try to establish, and the norm was we have to be as far away as possible to eat from each other. Uh, and at the same time, we have to be, be peaceful and sort of like in communal um, agreement so that there is no conflict between uh, those things. And so these early architectural developments and you know, especially those related to the agrarian productions related to that kind of ideology, um, you know, they are part of the premises on how the country built up, but also the kind of architectures that uh, emerge from that. And so there's a few milestones which makes Costa Rica quite a, an interesting independent, um, let's say, case in Latin America, but certainly Central America, which has been extremely tumultuous in terms of dictatorships, revolutions, so on and so forth. And so the first one is that this guy in this picture uh, very cleverly abolished the army in 1948. So the first thing I wanted to say is that Costa Rica is one of the few countries in the world that has no army whatsoever. There's no military, there's no soldiers, and you know, um, they literally say every mother in the country can rest assured that the, the only thing they know for sure is that their son and daughters are never going to be soldiers. Uh, and so that's one of the premises of Costa Rica as a country. The second one is that there were a few years, especially between the 1885, 1985 and uh, 1990, where a lot of outstanding things happened. This is a, an ex-president of the country. He won the Nobel uh, Peace Prize, where basically he managed to put a plan forward for all Central America to achieve to achieve uh, peace. And if you think at this point, I think the, the population was around 2 million people. So Toronto is bigger than Costa Rica in that sense. Uh, to have a Nobel Prize worldwide was quite a big thing. And then the year after, um, because Costa Rica, all the money that went to the military went into the educational system. Uh, there's been a, quite a few prominent, you know, scholars, scientists, so on and so forth. This one being the first Austrian of now said that it's not American uh, in, in, in its birth. So the first Latin America to go into space, the first non-United uh, States citizen. Uh, and he ended up being the longest, um, the longest time in space of all Austria. So this, his name is Franklin Chan. He's also one of these figures. And he has brought a lot of the industry. He went back to Costa Rica. He has brought a lot of the industry of uh, aerospace into the country, including the development of um, technologies on hydrogen. The next year, we had the first woman, I think, in, in Central America to win the first gold medal in the Olympics for swimming. So these were a few quite important happening years for Costa Rica. And then um, nowadays, I don't know if you know this woman, uh, she is basically... Her name is Karen Christina Figueres. She's the daughter of the president who abolished the army, but she has been appointed executive secretary of the climate change for the United Nations. And she was basically in charge of uh, figuring out the Paris Agreement. Uh, she has been uh, sort of like the leading voice in, uh, you know, climate change and the possible solutions for that. And she has become this sort of personality. Uh, and again, I think the last one, uh, before jumping into the projects is that Costa Rica has also, because of its sort of positioning in terms of nature, uh, its water resources, forest resources, so on and so forth, it's one of the few countries that runs almost entirely, if not entirely, on renewable energy resources. So we don't burn coal, uh, we don't have nuclear um, power plants, but everything is produced hydroelectri hydroelectrically uh, through water dams that were built in the past. And so it is almost a net zero network of energy, except for transportation, which is of course a bit of a disaster like it is everyone everywhere else. Um, and so just to go now, this is a, a very fun uh, news clip from the 1800s where you know this was the way they used to portray holidays in Costa Rica, which in fact has become lately a bit of a boutique country in terms of vacationing. Uh, but you know, it was literally going you know, with horses going through mud, and that was the idea of vacationing in Costa Rica. And today, you can see how this actually has changed. People like Giselle Bunchen, who was uh, sort of like a top supermodel, and Tom Brady, uh, you know, the the uh, the football player. They have a house in there. Uh, all sorts of artists, Beyonce, Jay Z, all these people have and and have houses and come vacation there. So this is just to give you a bit of a premise of how Costa Rica really stands between in some sort of like spectacular achievements, if you wish, in terms of sports, in terms of science, in terms of peace. Um, but at the same time, how it has become this sort of oasis for tourism with both its benefits and its problems. And so this is really the context for the summer studio workshop for no artificial ingredients. Basically, the length of the program 
It's going to be three and a half weeks, uh, starting July 2nd and then running until July 26th. Um, the way it is structured uh, for the moment, because, you know, there's still a bit of, of, of juggling time to figure these things out. But the first few days we'll spend in the city. Uh, then we'll go on a tour around the country for like a week. And then we're working in pair with a university, a local university called the, the Veritas, uh, which will provide space and a site for us to work from. Uh, and then we'll develop the project in the next two weeks. So basically there is sort of like a week, a week and a half of, of travel and two weeks of work, although they can include uh, traveling. Um, the structure, and I'll, I'll talk a bit uh, subsequently about it, the structure of the of the projects, basically, there are so many climatic zones that we are gonna develop one project, each, one, each student will choose one for um, a site in the tropical rainforest, meaning mountains, a site for the uh, the dry forest, meaning the beach and tropical wet and dry climates, which is basically the city of its surroundings. Uh, so you'll have three ecological systems at place in terms of the of the, the site. And then we're gonna concentrate on some standard materials that are used in the country, meaning probably wood, corrugated metal, concrete blocks, wood plants, cement boards, which are probably um, the main used. And so we're gonna develop three prototypes for rural, semi-urbanized and intensely urbanized areas. And at the same time, um, again, we're gonna use three different materials. The application, I think, is a standard for everyone. So basically, a paragraph describing your interest, uh, 10 work samples, and a short CV. And Petrus has a better information on this, but it's open to all HBAS students um, with the requirements or to MR, MR and MLA students. Uh, I'm not sure how that, in fact, works or not. But Petra, you can address that lately, hopefully. Um, so basically the first size would be the city. You can see the high contrast of the city, basically a well-developed modern infrastructure to the left and the kind of like low rise old city to the right. That'll be the first site we'll be at. The second one is the uh, humid rainforest. This is Monteverde, basically one of the, of the most exuberant cloud forest uh, in the world. And then the third side is really the dry forest. This is uh, a picture from Malpais, which is one of the, the wonderful beaches uh, in the East. And those would be the three sides. Um, the type of architecture we will be developing, I think for the length of the course and the kind of intensity of the course, it's uh, I think it's quite interesting. There are agrarian structures uh, very particular to the country, like this type of buildings you basically don't see anywhere else. Um, none of them is for humans. They're either for products or animals, which is kind of an interesting thing to do, I believe. And so we will be designing on the one half, this is a coffee barn that has to deal with the section of the mountain to deliver the coffee to the trucks. So that's one type of structure. You will be doing research. These are, are my own drawings uh, from the past studying this kind of like sectional problem. Uh, we will be doing some uh, drawing exercises and then you will be designing your own version. Uh, and that has to do with the mountains. The second one has to do with the plain and the dry um, and the dry forest, which will be basically a cow pen and the subsidiary structures, um, which is a fun exercise that even Cedric Price has done in the past uh, or did in the past. And basically, it's a series of roofs and 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 subsidiary structures to manage the um, basically the management of cattle, and that's in the flat. And then the third one is actually a wood production uh, facility, uh, a drying facility for wood. And here you can see how it is stacked and it has all the, the kind of like very artisanal uh, machinery within it. So, so far these are um, the plans for the projects, each one of those in a different ecosystem. And so we run a similar project in the past, what, the way it is organized and, and we are hoping to do basically something similar is that there's a local person that basically will organize a whole package for us. And it's very convenient uh, this time or last time they were all houses in the same site. Um, basically, they each one had their rooms. There was a dining, you know, a game uh, room. Everyone stays in the same place and there's a cooker that comes or a set of cookers that come in the morning. You get breakfast and then you get dinner and the only thing you have to do yourself is lunch. And so this is fairly convenient, but it's also quite fun uh, how it plays out there and the food was actually quite good 
Then transportation is sort of set for us. This is These are the, the people that went at that year. I think it was 2018 or something. Uh, you can see the topography of the country there with, uh, you know, the people standing in real vertically and the bus being tilted. Um, but basically transportation is all figured out for, for us from the airport to the place, to the airport back, to all the beaches and within the city. And then I usually try to, this is my own house and that's my dad to the right. Uh, and he's a fan of cooking paella. So I invited all the students to my house. I think it's quite uh, quite interesting when people actually get to understand where you come from and kind of the dynamics of, of how, uh, you know, families and so on and so forth. So that was a fun thing to have all students come to my old parents' house and, you know, with, with one's own room. Uh, uh, we'll visit the mountain, tropic, uh, tropical forest. Again, they have these suspension bridge structures. We take tours there. We look at uh, kind of like the ecosystems and the architectures that are developed by it. They are quite astonishing in their relationship to the sort of environment, uh, but also their engineering, um, you know, deployment. Uh, we also go again to these sites that have this wonderful beachscapes, um, you know, and at a time where there's a little people around, so they're fairly, these are, all, these are only students, that, the ones that you see in the picture, there was nobody else. Um, and basically they get to understand the relationship, uh, you know, not only between tourism and the country, but also, uh, let's say between the coast, the mountains and the architecture. Uh, we set a set of visits with practitioners from the country. So this is a house by John Osborne, which is a local practitioner. We go there, we saw the house, uh, he took us to a site under construction with some, you know, particular and peculiar architecture. Uh, you know, he also came and lectured to the class. Uh, so basically we have like three, four uh, practitioners that come, lecture us, they take us to their buildings and they get us sort of acquainted with the site. And I just want to show the few examples that we developed again a few years back. The program is different. This were houses built in a particular material for one of those sites. So this was actually a residential program. This is Mariano's work, who's now a professor here, by the way, teaching a couple of studios, I believe. So that's fun to see his student work, or I hope for him it is. Um, basically, it was a wood house uh, in the mountain range. Then there was Fu's work, which was a residential uh, unit for the city, um, uh, the, the cityscape or the urban setting. So it was more of a um, enclosed sort of scheme. This is Jeannie Lim, not Jeannie Kim, who did the scheme for the beach. Basically, it's a, kind of like a cluster in a tower. And she developed all this set of drawings with you know all sorts of different atmospheres and architecture. So um, that's pretty much what I, what I had in mind. Um, I don't know if I'm missing anything, Petrus. I think the program changed a bit from the last year uh, or the last time we did it. Uh, but basically that's the sort of premise of the studio. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mauricio. Just one clarification based on the current planning uh, from the Dean's office. Uh, these courses are not available to grad students uh, as of yet. Uh, Cross that out. They're <laughs> primarily they're currently available to undergraduate students. Okay. Um, I, I think Peter could go next. Um, Thank you. Um, thank you very much, uh, Petros. And also thank you, Mauricio. That that just looks um, absolutely fantastic. I'm going to share my screen now. So it will just take one moment. Desktop and PowerPoint. Okay. Um, I had the, the honor and the really great pleasure of bringing a group of students from Daniels to Berlin in Germany last summer. And I'm beyond thrilled um, to get to do this again um, this summer. Um, you see our group um, waiting on a on an S on a U-Bahn on a subway platform in Berlin. There, and I'd like to start by saying that because a version of this course was offered last year, the people who took it and they're your they're your classmates and they're people who are around Daniels um, can really give you the best opinion and I think the most truthful. Um, um, most truthful information about what it was like to be a student in this course. Um, who am I? So I know there are many of you whom I've had the pleasure of teaching in ARC 251 or ARC 352 or both, some in the past, some right now. Um, but I know many of you won't have taken those courses and that that's great as well. I'm an architectural historian, and in particular, I study how buildings and cities are represented in photography and films and other media. 
The subtitle of the course is Berlin, a city in film. And its basic present its basic premise is that as outsiders, um I, I am absolutely convinced a really good way to to get to know the city and to learn about it, especially a city like Berlin, is by studying the way it has been represented, the way it has appeared in films that are set in Berlin. And this is something that I, I, I've written about and I've studied and recently um, I published an article with Eflux on how the Berlin Wall appears in films or appeared in films. Now, what will we do in Berlin? Well, by day, we will visit uh, buildings, museums, landscapes, all sorts of sites, uh, including the Reichstag, the German parliament, uh, which is now surmounted by a glass dome designed by Norman Foster. We'll walk the Karl Marx Allee, which was the first street of socialism, and we'll see buildings like the Kino Internationale. So there actually was a cinema at the heart of the planning of this great boulevard in the former East Berlin. We'll visit buildings like the Staatsratsgebäude, which was the former uh, government headquarters of East Germany, um, now actually a business school, but they've kept a lot of the, the socialist realist um, artwork. We'll see icons like the Fernsehturm, uh, Berlin's television tower, um, previously a symbol of technological modernity, and now um, really, I think, the, the most well-known structure in the reunited city of Berlin. And we'll visit monuments and other places of key historical memory, like Peter Eisenman's Memorial to the Murdered Jews of Europe, and Egon Ehrman's reconstruction of the Kaiser Wilhelm Memorial Church, which during the Cold War was really the symbol of West Berlin. We'll see Katie Kollwitz's sculpture in Germany's Memorial to the Victims of War and Tyranny uh, in Karl Friedrich Schinkel's Royal Guard House. And right across the street is Misha Ullman's empty library, uh, which commemorates the 1933 book burnings on the Bebelplatz in Berlin. And as Heine Keine uh, presciently said a century earlier, where they burn books, they will someday burn people, which sadly turned out to be true. We will walk along part of the former course of the Berlin Wall and see many of the different ways in which it has been commemorated. And we'll visit, and this was a, a particularly moving experience for me as a historian, and I know that the students were very moved by it as well. We'll visit the archives of the Stasi of East Germany's former secret police. And in these kilometers and kilometers of files, I think really get an idea for the absolute banality of evil, especially as it appeared in the 20th century. We will tour uh, the former Tempelhof Airport um, and appreciate the sort of unhuman scale of this Nazi temple to aviation, which then also became a symbol of freedom during the Berlin airlift in 1948 and 49. So if that's what we're doing during the day, what will we, what will we do at night? Well, we will watch films. Um, sometimes they will be at open air venues, so this is the group last year watching a 1927 silent film accompanied by a new electronic music soundtrack in the courtyard of, of Berlin's traditional housing typology, the Mitkaselna. Other times we'll go to cinemas, sometimes big ones, um, sometimes small independent cinemas like Lichtblick, um, that's right here. And on other occasions, we'll meet uh, in more intimate venues um, to watch more experimental films. We'll also go to the Olympiastadion, where the 1936 Olympics were held and where Jesse Owens famously won four gold medals. In terms of the films, you'll end up watching about 15 or 16 feature films in total which will really give you a very good picture of cinema in Berlin. Seven of those will be before we travel, and I'll explain that um, in, in a few slides, and the rest will be during the evenings while we're in Berlin. 
We'll stay at um, a student residence called the Social Hub, which is very, very close to Alexanderplatz, um, right in the heart of the city. And we'll also take day trips. So once we'll go to Potsdam, which is quite close to Berlin, we'll see um, um, Eric Mendelssohn's Einstein Tower. Um, we'll also in Potsdam um, get to visit uh, the film museum because um, the Babelsberg Film Studios, which is sort of Germany's Hollywood, are in Potsdam. And also see many buildings by uh, Carl Friedrich Schinkel for the royal family, which was based there. And a little bit further afield, we'll spend a day in Dessau visiting the Bauhaus, um, the, the kind of famous uh, design school uh, designed and led by Walter Gropius and other modernist buildings from the interwar period in Dessau. All of this is quite honestly going to be fantastic, but also um, exhausting. Um, and so uh, where necessary, we will stop for, for coffee and other refreshments to give us the energy to keep going. Now, the assignments. So what are you going to do as work um, in Berlin? These have been, um, have been conceived and organized, and I'm about to explain them. Um, around the idea of, of filmmaking and other practices for making images and representations of cities. And what interests me in these, um, partially it's the idea of teaching new things to you, and actually at certain moments taking you a bit out of your comfort zone, precisely so that the summer course, and Petros taught, um, touched on this earlier, so that the summer course can actually provide a moment of reflection um, about how you do things and about some of the things you've been taught um, at the Daniels faculty. Some of the assignments will be individual, others will be in small groups, and there's even one assignment that the whole group will do together to make a single drawing. The major assignment, which really fits with the theme of the course, um, is a filmmaking one. So students will work with a team of local filmmakers from the Labor Berlin Collective to make eight or 16 millimeter analog films. We worked with these same filmmakers last year and it was really fantastic. Um, they were able to guide the students towards using uh, cameras and techniques that, that almost everyone had, had, never, had never used before. And they also were really great guides um, to take the students to different places in the city and to be able to suggest where to go film. Why filmmaking and especially analog filmmaking? Well, first of all, it's to expose you to a new technique and to get you to, to learn um, to do something different during the time that we're in Berlin. And analog filmmaking in particular offers a chance to reflect upon or, and maybe to critique, but also to better understand a lot of the digital um, techniques that, that we teach and learn at Daniels. And it also provides you an opportunity to see the city and its buildings through the lens, if you will. And all of a sudden, by filmmaking and by putting a lot of thought into making images, it, it shows one way of looking at a city is to actually understand it as this series of potential images that are waiting to be brought to life by your camera. We will also do a, a brief exercise in analog photography with the Aperture Photo Lab uh, in Berlin. This won't be a big thing, but it'll be a chance to think uh, about how about how photographs are made, and especially um, to to practice uh, making them and also printing them in a dark room. We'll spend an afternoon at the P ninety eight Gallery, which is which was founded by the graphic designer Eric Spiekermann, um, doing analog printmaking. Again, thinking of different different techniques and different ways of, of assembling and making text and images. And we'll work with Jennifer O'Donnell and Jonathan Janssens of Plattenbau Studio, so they're Berlin-based architects, um, to make a collective drawing together as, as a group. We will meet with local writers, architects, filmmakers, scholars, um, last year, we had the great pleasure of spending a morning with Musa Okwanga, who's a Berlin-based writer. 
hopeful we can see him again this year, but you know, we'll have to we'll have to wait and see. But we'll all read his book in the end. It was all about love before traveling to Berlin. Final assignment will be for students to make daily postcards to document what we're seeing on the course. And for some people, this will be a literary exercise, you know, trying to write uh, 20 or 30 or 40 words to describe what we're seeing. And other people will treat it more as a form of conceptual or postal art, um, especially inspired by works by people like uh, On Kagawa, who we see on the screen. Practical things. So we will be in Berlin from the 30th of July until the 19th of August, 2024, which makes for 20 nights in total. During the months before the trip in May and June and July, we'll meet for six hour long uh, seminars on Zoom. So about every two weeks. These, um, first of all, will be scheduled so as many participants as possible can attend. And people who have a conflict uh, because of time zone or work or other courses will absolutely be accommodated. So I, I don't want this to be a stressful thing at all. They're just meant as preliminary discussions around readings and films that we'll watch beforehand as a way for us to get to know each other and as a way for me to really start to understand what are the things that are of interest to you as we go to explore Berlin. And as part of these seminars, we'll read two very short books, and, and we're not reading them for, for an exam or a test or anything. We're just reading them as introductions to the city. So Brian Ladd's The Ghosts of Berlin, and as I mentioned earlier, Musa Okwanga's personal memoir about Berlin. In the end, it was all about love. The cost will be approximately 4600 Canadian dollars, which includes airfare, your accommodation, local transport, entrance fees, workshops, and the materials for the workshops, and meals. The thing that it excludes is the tuition that you will pay to the Daniels faculty to take this course. Um, I put approximate because essentially I've set aside a, a piece of that budget for an airplane ticket from Toronto, Berlin return, but obviously depending upon um, upon where you're traveling from or when you buy your ticket or which airline you choose, that could change a bit. Um, the meals, um, food's fairly inexpensive in Germany, uh, but they're mainly imagining that you'll also do um, uh, make some of your own meals, whether that's sandwiches or, or cooking pasta or, or, or whatever. And there are kitchens at the social hub where you'll stay. How do you reply? So Petros hinted at certain that some of the the, um, the summer courses have slightly different application uh, requirements. And for the Berlin course, what you have to do is watch Wim Wenders' Wings of Desire. It's a 1987 film. It can be found on the Criterion channel online. And there's a link in the course description on the Daniels website. And you can anyone can sign up actually for two weeks free with the Criterion channel, and then you can watch Vim Vendor's Wings of Desire or uh, find it elsewhere on DVD, uh, for example. And then once you've watched the film, I want you to make three postcards. So a postcard being something with an image on one side and text on the other. The first, just introducing yourself, telling me who you are. Um, the second, um, to get your thoughts on the film, and these can be positive, they can be negative, you can tell me why you didn't like it, you can critique it, or you can celebrate a part of it. And you might also ask a question, say, you know, I didn't understand, or I'd like to know more about this building or this place that I've seen. And third is for you to tell me why you would like to go to Berlin. And um, these postcards are helpful for, for me and for, for Petros and others to, to help select students for the course. But I think they're also really good for you to actually ask the question, you know, do I want to watch films like this? Why do I want to go to Berlin? Um, why would I be interested in this? Applications due on February 19th at the end of the day. Uh, there's an online submission. And I also would like you to drop off um, um, kind of real material postcards, which can just be printed on ordinary computer paper, it's fine, um, at the Daniels reception. Um, let me end by saying thank you. Um, and at the end of our session today, I'm very happy to answer questions or else uh, by email in the coming days. 
And now it's my pleasure to um, to hand things back uh, to Petros, who's going to introduce the Athens course. Thank you, Peter. Um, I imagine that some of you may have to jump out of the call and go to class, uh, as some of you are already joining. So we are recording the session and it will be available in about a week. Uh, there's a kind of short turnaround time uh, for your applications. Uh, I think it's they're really due in 12 days, uh, 13 days maybe. Uh, so this is something for you to consider. Uh, it's been very important for us to push back our deadlines compared to last year um, in order to run the process better and also uh, in order to allow enough time for, for planning the trips uh, uh, for yourselves. Um, so a few words about the Athens course. Um, I have been teaching co this course uh, uh, for the past uh, for the past two years. So there there are, as Peter also mentioned, there are many of your peers who have taken it who are still Daniel students, um, and they're really the best uh, persons to ask about it. Uh, about the experience of the course, uh, about the requirements, the difficulty, the intensity of it and everything. Um, we also had an info session once our uh, course list was uh, concluded last year where ex-Athenians, ex as we call them, uh, were able really to give uh, on the ground information to those traveling to Athens. And that was also very useful. So, um, the course includes a number of different parts and a number of different components, um, but it really is a way for you to get to know a city like Berlin, uh, like San Jose in Costa Rica, that is completely different from Toronto and a city that has a kind of visible traces of a very long history and a very specific and unique way of growing and developing across 3000 years. Um, and that this experience and this knowledge of the city uh, within three intensive weeks, uh, but also periods of study and preparation prior to that, and also some work after that, is really something that stays with you, that gets imprinted in, in your kind of uh, architectural memory um, and uh, really opens up the way that you see your own studies here in, in, in at the Daniels faculty, they will, the way that you experience Toronto, the way that you understand architecture uh, or urbanism. So this is really the goal of the course, uh, to, to kind of open up your scope uh, about uh, contemporary urbanism. And we, we are looking at Athens as a laboratory of that. And we're looking at all these different processes that have been um, transforming the city, especially over the last 200 years, uh, but longer as well. That's one aspect of the course. The other aspect of the course is the idea of the itinerary, the idea that uh, moving through a city and walking through a city and actually making that part of your process of learning uh, uh, is uh, perhaps the best way uh, to understand it. Um, Athens is a city that has been transforming rapidly over the past uh, 60 years, especially. Uh, and you might, again, have an image of Athens uh, based on media, based on uh, sort of various tourist narratives that we may see. Uh, but I think your your experience uh, as part of this course uh, will probably surprise you. Um, this course is fundamentally structured as a series of walks. There's seven walks, and each of these walks through different areas of the city, some of them including uh, a you know, a minibus, some of them uh, very short around the historic center. Each of them is a seminar and a lecture and a way to also involve uh, other architects and historians and archaeologists in the telling of, of the story of urban transformation. Um, and it, each walk opens to specific spaces where we stay, we, we linger, we sit, uh, squares, garden, floorscapes, buildings, monuments, waterscapes, uh, archaeological sites. Um, and that first segment of the course is really a way to understand the city. In response to that, you're all producing um, 
while moving through the city, uh, a series of documentation. So you're not just um, being there as a tourist, you're actually drawing and taking photos and being critical about what it is that you're, see that you're seeing. Um, and this becomes your first assignment for the course, which is really uh, looking through the city through your own eyes, but also looking through the city through a series of media. Uh, and the, fun the primary of this media is really drawing or at least some document, some artifact where you can collect your observations, your documentations of the city um, into a concise narrative. And that is what a log is or a travel log. Um, and this will be a kind of requirement to have you reflect really on the process of getting to know a new city uh, and constantly be aware of this process of observation and, and make that part of your sketchbook or make that part of your Instagram account or make that part of your, uh, you know, archive of, of study. Uh, so this idea of logs and artifacts is really important. Um, you have almost eventually to develop your own reaction to the city, your own particular focus and story, whether that is on people or on housing or an episode that you happen to witness in Athenian public space and that somehow motivates your further writing and observation. But you'll be joining a kind of number of students who've had the opportunity to do this uh, over the past uh, many, many years. And this idea of the log or the artifact is something that is truly open-ended um, and uh, uh, really kind of reflects on your own uh, skills and, and interests. Uh, but it's also a very old story because Athens has been one of those cities of the Eastern world for a very long time that has been a tourist destination and has been uh, a tour destination, especially in the 17th, 18th and 19th centuries. Uh, wealthy Europeans uh, would get on a boat and then they would get on a caravan and then they would visit um, this place, this strange place that was Athens uh, 200, uh, 300 years ago uh, to discover the origins of Western culture as they imagined would exist in this place. And they often encountered uh, a very different Athens than uh, what they had in their minds or what they had in their libraries. The grand tour, as this process is called, uh, is also a way of exercising power, uh, a way of visiting a place and then taking back some uh, uh, gifts uh, out of your own agency and putting them in museums. These are some of the early, uh, early tourists to Athens um, who engaged in exactly this process. So we'll be reflecting on that legacy and we'll be reflecting on that legacy as a kind of question of giving and taking, uh, of uh, exercising power, but also of drawing and producing images. Because the way that those who participated in the old Grand Tours did it uh, was not through Instagram, but it was through drawing. It was through uh, etchings and engravings and watercolors where they established their own point of view and image of the city uh, into these documents, into these works that then were shared in Western media. And that also speaks to the support that Athens can be because one of the other things we'll be constantly discussing is the identity that has been motivating the history of this city that is uh, really sees it as the kind of cradle of civilization, the cradle of, the, of Western civilization. Um, Athens uh, is much more ambivalent than that because it also is an Eastern city. It's a city of the East Mediterranean or of the Levant, where many cultures have sort of crossed over and left marks. And the very process of making the city and rediscovering and rebuilding the city in very short bursts over the last 200 years has been this also way for different architects and powers that be to claim identity and tell a very specific story about this city. And we'll be visiting various areas and, and places uh, in the uh, fringe and in the center of the city. Um, one of the main tools that you will be asked to use in your documentations, apart from images, apart from this travel log, would also be drawing, um, reflecting on the long legacy of, of uh, architects and artists and travelers to Athens, producing 
uh, maps and drawings and their own kind of understanding uh, of, of uh, certain uh, things that have always been there, um, but also documentations of the contemporary city, documentations of the facades of Athens, of its extreme density, of its human scale, uh, and truly active uh, street life specific um, urban uh, developments that allow the street life to exist in uh, short spaces and in extreme mixed use, we can say. Uh, the idea that the ground is not just uh, a surface, but it's something that is very deep uh, and layered. And if you have the right tools and knowledge, you can actually x-ray through it and understand the different layers of history that are literally piling one on top of uh, another in a palimpsest. Um, and uh, also the city as a series of, you know, fragments, a work in progress, an endless process of breaking apart and being put back together. And some of these are uniquely Athenian characteristics. There's a certain number of cities around perhaps this Mediterranean, but maybe also around the world that are not very good at curating their history, but they're very good at kind of reusing different parts of it uh, in constantly rebuilding and burying their history. So this is something we'll be looking at. Another fundamental lens of the course is the idea that we don't have to look at urban space as uh, a series of uh, zones or areas or even plots on a map, uh, but as a series of lines, a series of vectors, as a series of routes through the city. And that this idea of the vector or this idea of the route is, as I already said, something that motivates our own experience of the course, but is actually something that is constant in the city of Athens. And a big part of our learning and discussion will be the fact that um, there are stories, very old stories, embedded in specific monuments, rocks, um, works of architecture, uh, but also uh, landscape features. Um, and the best way to unlock and understand those stories is by walking. The act of walking uh, creates this, uh, let's say, montage uh, and this way of remembering and, and, and learning what you are seeing or not seeing as you cross the city. So the idea of the walk as something that unlocks your experience of the city is really important. And it's a story that goes all the way back to, um, you know, pre-classical antiquity uh, and even imprinted on some of the classical monuments of Athens. But the idea of the walk is also something that is very much present uh, as a vector in, in the contemporary city and as a way to understand its public space. Um, if something remains constant in the constant transformation of, of the city are these routes. These routes have not changed. They might have been water bodies, streams or rivers, and they have turned into roads. Uh, or they might have been ancient walls that have turned into uh, walkways. Um, but some of these things are always acts of moving uh, between different uh, geographic sort of elements of the city. And they are uh, constant and we will be walking and understanding them as such. Um, so the idea of the laboratory of change, that the city is a work in progress, the idea of entropy, that certain cities have a way of changing that is not very linear, uh, that operates in states of emergency or catastrophic bursts, the idea of the informal, uh, of uh, the incomplete. These are all things we will encounter um, in our experience, uh, in our study of the contemporary city of Athens. We'll also reflect on democracy and monuments and the relationship of them uh, as uh, present within a specific urban landscape. Uh, but also we will reflect on, on crisis uh, and the actual climate pressures uh, that are very much uh, intensely present in the fabric of the city. Uh, and, and what are the true the real challenges of uh, um, urban transformation vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the climate crisis. Um, and also understand the impact of the recent financial crisis um, that totally transform the social and political structure of uh, Greece uh, and Athens in specific. Um, our roots will take us to the coastline, uh, to a series of large scale works of architecture like Renzo Piano's uh, um, Stavros Niarchos Cultural Center Park, 
uh, and artificial hill, uh, the eighth hill of Athens, really, uh, or the post-industrial uh, park in Drapetsona and Keratsini, an unknown but really vibrant public space of the city. We will look at different representations of the city, including footage from police cameras in certain areas that are politically contested, understand this uh, kind of uh, constant negotiation uh, between citizens uh, and urban space. Um, this idea that the city can be constructed as a series of cinematic frames, especially when we study uh, and visit its ancient monuments, including the Acropolis and the Parthenon, uh, Keramikos, the walkways of uh, Philopapu, and so on and so forth. And the idea that it doesn't really make sense to understand the city as a process of tabula rasa and building from scratch. There's nothing from scratch in the urban fabric of Athens, even if sometimes it looks like that. There's always a process of demolition and reconstruction, and that process is an ideological and political process. Um, some of these paragraphs that you're seeing are really part of the course description and some of the things that I've been saying. Uh, a key aspect of the course um, is where we'll be working and who we'll be working with. So apart from walking and visiting and having access to uh, certain spaces uh, in the city, uh, we will be based in the Museum of Contemporary Art, which is really an amazing uh, institution, really at the center of Athens. Uh, and doing some of our work and meetings there. Uh, and that will be the starting point of uh, all of our seven walks. Um, and uh, we will also be collaborating with colleagues who are uh, active in understanding Athens as a process of urban transformation, practicing architecture and urbanism in the city, uh, and also teaching architecture at the University of Patras. We are trying to set up a common workshop with students uh, from the University of Patras for about half of the duration of the course. These uh, collaborations have been truly transformative in the past. Our students have really learned amazing things about uh, cities and about doing architecture uh, and drawing uh, and, and, and documenting cities by their collaborations with students from local universities. So this is an extremely important part and we're trying to make it work. It's something uh, currently TBD, but most likely to be part of our schedule. But really the course in the end is about public space and your approach to the city uh, will be looking at all these different forms of public space and how they uh, envelop the city or how they're experienced uh, through these uh, acts of walking. Beaches, uh, hills and archeological monuments, central designed squares, uh, 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 cultural sites, uh, the process and events of uh, actively participating in public space, the process of making and reclaiming public space, and the process of designing public space. Uh, many of the students who participate in the course kind of bring a lot of Athenian baggage. I, I would like to think of good baggage uh, in their architectural skills and arsenal. And then this makes its way into different thesis projects, like this one from Yvonne Fu from um, maybe three or four years ago, who's looking at the, these void spaces of a particular uh, neighborhood in Athens and imagining a way to repopulate them as a work in progress, uh, as a meanwhile uh, redesign process. Our schedule, um, the actual travel dates would be between, uh, um, well, um, the actual travel dates will be between May 14th and June 4th. Uh, the first part uh, of the course will include a series of meetings, introductions, uh, making sure we have all our logistics in place at the Daniels faculty. Uh, that will also include connecting you to uh, previous uh, participants in the course uh, and also preparing you for different aspects of it. Um, sharing a series of uh, readings in advance uh, and maybe explaining a number of things within the month of April in common time that we may be able to find. But then travel will be happening uh, just before May 14th. And our first meeting, our first walk in the city will be in the late afternoon of May 14th. And the course will continue until June 4th. Um, in the first, the, the, our seven walks will be front loaded. So they would really happen in, during the first uh, few days. Um, and then our collaborations, workshops, uh, and uh, um, eventual kind of design project and proposal will take place 
uh, during the last 10 days uh, or a couple of weeks of the course. Um, and it is an intensive experience and, and you might even find it challenging uh, to uh, you know, design and think and read while you're experiencing the city. So there will also be a time after uh, the travel is concluded for you to kind of revisit your works uh, and your um, your final drawings and 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 really share them uh, with the group online as you reflect back on your journey. So I think that's the short of it. Again, um, Mauricio, I apologize if you're still here. I at some point I told you that it was ten work samples. We're actually you were right in the first time. We're asking for five work samples from students, uh, a paragraph describing your interest in this particular course uh, that you're applying for, and a short CV so that we know who you are. Um, and you know, as you know, the course is open to students really uh, entering their third and fourth year of study. Um, and you can read a few more things about it uh, on our website. Um, Different instructors might have different requirements. I think Peter already explained his postcard requirement and, and his request to you that you also understand the process of that is really the, the start of your interest in the course. Um, but you can submit for all the other courses, all this material in one online application where you will also have to rank your preference uh, based on your research interest, uh, academic interest, uh, favorite food, uh, um, um, you know, willingness to design, build versus travel or willingness to participate in an internship. Uh, so I think this is a good time for everyone to kind of consider what their uh, goals and what their interests and what their summer might look like uh, before they join. One last thing, uh, and sorry, I might have dragged a bit longer than expected. Uh, is that the estimated course of uh, the cost, the estimated cost of the Athens course will be around uh, four and a half thousand Canadian dollars, including travel, uh, stay in the center, in the historic center of the city, uh, and the kind of very reasonable budget for uh, food, which is very cheap there, plus, uh, you know, access to museums and a few logistical costs of, of you know, renting a bus together and uh, visiting a few places uh, at the periphery of the city but it's four and a half thousand. Um, and there are a number of bursaries also available to you, uh, you know, via the Center of Your International Experience uh, and the Daniels faculty that maybe we can start asking, uh, answering questions about. But I'll, I'll keep it at that for now. And maybe uh, you can share your questions uh, in the chat if you like. Um, and we can... Um, Try and answer those in the in the next uh, you know in the next few moments or hour. Thank you. Maybe we answered all your questions. Okay. Are students who are currently doing ARC 201 allowed to apply? Yes. Uh, you can apply uh, if you are en route to complete ARC 201 um, by the end of this term. So by the start of the course, the summer term, you would have needed to have completed the requirements of your third year, of your second year. Mauricio, there's a question about the the schedule of the Costa Rica travel. Hey, so we're thinking, I think it's July 2nd, which is a Tuesday, I believe. Yes, July 2nd to uh, July 26th. So that's three and a half-ish weeks. And also I got a, I got a, a direct message about the cost of the Costa Rican uh, studio, which I didn't address. I believe the total cost will be around um, very similar to, to what Peter and Petrus are mentioning. The only uh, numbers that I'm trying to corroborate is that we are using US dollars uh, instead of Canadian dollars for all the budgeting. And so there's 
I just need to confirm these things, but I believe the cost would be fairly around those numbers. Um, it's going to be probably around 3,500 uh, Canadian dollars. That's my estimation, give and take, uh, but it will not include the plane ticket. So the plane ticket would be, let's say, the responsibility of each one of the students. Thank you. I'll manage some of the questions and kind of uh, shoot them back to you as requested. Uh, so I think there's a few, well, expected cost for the Athens study abroad would be four and a half thousand Canadian dollars, in, including travel, room and board, and, and local, you know, uh, transport and such, uh, and access to cultural sites. And uh, there's tuition, Summer tuition is, is paid separately by you, so that will be a additional. Um, and there's a question about the kind of submission, a couple of questions about the submission application process. Uh, you can submit works that you feel are relevant to the particular course you're interested in. Uh, I mean, I, I would expect that the majority of people would submit studio work from, from Daniels. Uh, but uh, you can also submit work that you've done in other contexts, um, for sure. Um, including non-academic projects. And there's a question about how competitive the applications are. Um, we, we don't know. I mean, last year, I think, uh, I think design research internship cost was uh, course was quite competitive, so not everyone who applied managed to get a place. The travel courses, in my memory, I think almost everyone who applied to the different travel courses was able to to find a place there, and it was similar to the design build studios. Um, I mean, the, when we look at your applications, we consider kind of you know a whole package of of where you are in your uh, current academic journey. Uh, I think, you know, if you're a fourth year student, um, I think we'll try and give you a chance to participate in the, these courses rather than uh, if you're a student uh, just finishing your second year. Uh, if that, if it comes down to that, that would be a factor to give access to the courses to as wide range of students as possible. But I think in the past, uh, it's just a question of how many students are interested. Uh, and in the past, pretty much, I think people were able to enroll for at least one of the summer courses uh, that they applied for. I've also shared the uh, the link. So there's a link on the Daniels faculty website that gives you all the information you need to know for the courses and the application process. So that's a very important link for you all to see. Uh, I believe the travel dates are also included there. Yes, Peter. Your um, apologies. Uh, there's a question about the number of words on the postcards. Um, I didn't specify it. I think you can fit, I don't know, three or four sentences or or something like that. It's 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 certainly not meant to force people to write essays, but rather if you can raise in a, in a you know in in a nice paragraph kind of to get across what you're trying to say. I also note that another student has asked about Schengen visas or student visas. So I don't know what the Costa Rica situation is, but I think for both Germany and Greece, many students uh, won't need a visa, but there, there are students from many countries who would need a visa to travel, um, which I think is one of the reasons why Petros and the ORSS team have been trying to do this process earlier this year to leave a bit more time uh, for people to get the visas they need. Yeah, for, for... I think it depends to add to, to, add to Peter. Is it, it really depends on your country of origin. Um, I think if you have a Canadian or US passport, at least for Costa Rica, but I also believe in Europe, you wouldn't need a, a, a visa. But there are some other passports that may require that i suggest that you go to the you know to the um pertinent websites just to check what are the requirements for each one of the places and and those who will need a visa to travel to costa rica greece or germany um once they're part of the course we will be addressing the kind of application process for 
for Greece because the Greek consulate has a series of processes for um, applying, having an interview for visas. We we're in touch with them and we ask them to expedite certain processes. But again, this year will be way ahead from last year, so that should not be a problem. Um, again, the link on, on the Dangos website uh, includes application information, course specifics, and uh, also the link to the form where you submit your application. You can apply to multiple courses. Uh, this is a question that was just put in the chat. Um, in the form, I believe you will be asked to rank them. So what is your first, second, third, and fourth, and so on choice? So that we try and place you in, in the course that you uh, prefer. But you can apply to multiple courses. What is the living situation for the Athens trip? Will all the students be staying together? So uh, I'll tell you how we've done it in the past, uh, Leah. Um, in the past, we have recommended a series of uh, neighborhoods for the students to find an Airbnb. So the students have kind of, once the group is uh, settled and we will have the group settled, uh, I think sometime in March, uh, the students coordinate among themselves and they share an Airbnb rental. I am looking into finding uh, a place uh, where the entire group can stay together this year, specifically because there are good reasons to be skeptical about Airbnb um, as you know what, what it does to the center of certain cities. So uh, this is in progress and I will get back to you. The least that will happen is that we will make sure that students in different groups or as a group are staying in the same neighborhood. So that you're kind of all close to each other, which is usually a neighborhood in the in the center of Athens, uh, often near the uh, Museum of Contemporary Art uh, and uh, near a subway station and within walking distance to the historic center or in, in the historic center. So that's how we've organized it up to now. And there's a question about the bursary and the bursary options. Bianca, I don't know if you're with us, but I think this is a Bianca question. Uh, yes. Hello. <laughs> um, so there's a couple of options um, for some financial assistance for students um, traveling for these courses. So the first one that I would recommend is the International Experience Award. So this is um, funded through the Center for International Experience. Um, and basically, it's meant to assist with expenses related to travel for, for courses. Um, I will say now, these awards are not meant to cover the entire cost of your learning abroad experience, um, but mostly aiming to, to help with things like your flights and your accommodations while you're there. So um, it's definitely a recommended that you apply. And based on their website, they are recommending that students apply up to six weeks in advance of your travel, just so that um, you can hopefully have a decision before you go. Um, so I'll, I will add the link in the chat here for you to review the website and the application link is in there as well. Um, and like I said, there's no specific hard deadline. They just recommend applying six weeks in advance. So I'll put that in here. Um, and then something else that students can apply for uh, are the Daniels travel grants. So this is grant funding offered through the Daniels faculty for Daniels students. Um, and again, it's meant to provide a modest financial subsidy to cover a portion of the costs associated with um, this optional travel. Um, so that application is separate from the international experience one. And once students are enrolled in these courses, we're, we're happy to, um, to send the link to the application as well um, so that students can apply. And you can apply for both, either, like the funds through International um, Experience Office plus the Daniels Travel Grant. So I will link them both in here. Um, and one more thing I'll mention, I guess, kind of as a requirement to be eligible for these funds is that students are required to complete the safety abroad workshops. That's really important 
and you won't be eligible to receive funds unless those workshops are completed. Um, so just wanted to flag that as well. But yeah, I'll put the links in the chat for everybody here. Getting our applications early this year really allows you access to all of these resources uh, and the possibility to be fully prepared for travel, especially for the courses that happen in the May-June uh, semester. So there, there will be time to prepare and to organize our uh, mutual travels. And um, some of these bursaries also operate with you know, uh, may may be able to, you know, fund a, a part of your costs uh, after you've incurred this part. So you should also be aware. So you might get a bursary. Uh, I think the Daniels bursary would work this way uh, after you've paid for your ticket and accommodation and you might be reimbursed as a part of that. But in the end, that I think that has helped uh, many students in the, in the past, if you need it, right? I think it's also need is an important uh, question in this um, picture. So uh, check out the links uh, and the processes for which you can apply for these two bursaries. Um, we are aiming to have about 15 students for each one of the study abroad courses. Uh, I think last year we had 16 in Athens. Uh, the year before we had 12. So it's it's a, you know, it's a different mix. I think Berlin had more. I think Berlin had 18 or 19, perhaps. 18. Yeah. So for us, I think it also, at least for the Athens course, it makes sense. It has to be a group that we can kind of work together. And, you know, when we are stationed in a very narrow sidewalk, uh, we can talk to each other and kind of communicate with each other within all the noise of the city as part of our walking seminar. So there is a there is a kind of ideal size for which the class can work and we cannot really go above that. But I would say a ballpark of 15 students might make sense. Perhaps we answered already all the questions or maybe through our presentations. Uh, so maybe this was a most effective uh, session. Um, so I think Bianca just shared in the chat the safety abroad workshop information, the international experience award information and links and the travels grant application. So these are all resources that you can check out in advance. Okay, um, maybe, well, okay, last question, maybe. When when should you expect to hear back from applications? Very good question. Um, I'm just looking at my schedule here. I would say about the month after you apply, around March 18th, you will have the confirmation and, and decision of your participation. And then you will need to confirm as well. Like if you are accepted to a class, you need to confirm that you are that you will in fact be joining that. And shortly after that, uh, really the sometime around the end of March, we hope to have our first introductory meetings and have the class list in place and uh, so that students can start communicating with their instructors and, and and be making their individual plans. That's that's the current schedule. When applying through the website, the form states to submit student work and statement of interests. Are those things required for the application presented today or is it separate? Yes. To apply for the summer courses, you need to submit, to apply for the study abroad summer courses uh, and the design builds, I believe, you need to submit a statement of interest, a CV, and five samples of work. For the Berlin course, you also will need to uh, submit some of these samples in the postcard format that Peter has uh, recommended after seeing that film. So the Berlin course requirements are 
slightly more uh, spe specified and individualized, but the ballpark, the, the basic, the basis of your application needs to include CV statement and uh, work images. Um, there are no specification looking for their CVs. They don't need to be professional CVs. <laughs> they just need, I think we just need to know, you know, a few more things about you and about your journeys and about uh, your interests and experiences. The main difference between the design builds and the travel and abroad research courses. Well, actually there's three sets of courses. The travel abroad courses are really focused on visiting uh, another part of the world. And that, that travel is part of the course. You are meant to you know, get on a plane and, and be in Berlin, Costa Rica or Athens for more or less three weeks. So together with other students, you are immersed, you travel there, you study there, you do some of your work there. So that's the travel course, okay? The design build courses, I think all of them are would actually be held in Toronto. So they will be taking place in Toronto and each one of them, and there will be an info session, same time tomorrow, specifically for the three design builds that we're offering. So you can also attend that to learn more about it. The design build courses are about working and designing and then uh, constructing a one-to-one -one, uh, prototype, a structure, uh, in a public space in Toronto. So you'll be constructing it most likely in our fabrication lab here, and then you'll be assembling it and, and putting it together uh, in a public space in Toronto. This year, I think we have Toronto Islands. Uh, we have a kind of under construction site in the downtown. Um, and uh, there will also be a, a robotic design build that will actually be taking place in the Daniels faculty. So that's the design build. The design build includes the kind of designing and building of a one-to-one -one large scale uh, prototype through you know, student participation. And then the design research internship is actually a, a course and an internship that runs for two weeks. And you have all the information on that on the website. Um, and it's really about pairing you with local firms. So these are three very different courses. What they have in common is that they take place in the summer and that they're all kind of experiential learning. Okay, yes. And you apply to all of them together because they're all offered during the summer. Um, as Peter said, you can email us with individual questions about the course um, or any further clarifications that you may need, you can write uh, to me or to the registrar uh, regarding application process uh, or that, but I believe we've really answered everything and really your first point of, uh, uh, before asking the question should be the the course uh, descriptions on the Daniels website that we pasted, uh, you know, a few, um, a few chats above. I'll just re repaste it here in the chat. So thank you for your time, everyone. Uh, thank you for organizing I hope you are all excited for the summer it's going to be I think a great uh, great, great summer for everyone and um, we look forward to answering more questions if needed or seeing you in Costa Rica, Berlin and Athens that would really be the goal thank you Petra Thanks, Peter, Mauricio, Bianca. Thank you. Natanya, and see you soon.